Um, my name is David Long. I'm an author and I write books for children as well as adults. And um, my favourite books are non-fiction ones, so that's true stories about real people. And um, of my favourites, my absolute favourite at the moment is this one, which is called Survivors. And one of the reasons it's my favourite, apart from the fact I enjoyed writing it so much, is it won me a Blue Peter badge, which you can see here, which I'm very proud of. I had to wait till I was quite old to get my Blue Peter badge, but now I have one. Um, Survivors, as the name suggests, is about uh, it's stories about people who got into terrible situations, very dangerous situations, and um, survived them by being uh, very clever about what they did, and very thoughtful, and also very brave, because often they were on their own, and they're in terrible circumstances. One person fe fell into a volcano, um, other people got lost in deserts or trapped in caves, often they didn't have any help, and they had to rely on their own ideas and resourcefulness as well as being very exciting the stories have a happy ending as the uh, title of the book survivors tends to suggest so i'm going to read a story to you now and this is a story i heard i remember this being in the newspapers and on television when i was about 11 years old i've called it the girl who fell from the sky on christmas eve 17 year old julianne kopek was flying high above the south american rainforest when the airliner carrying her and her mother was hit by a violent storm the previous evening had been prom night at school, but now term was over and they were heading home for the holidays. Home meant the remote Amazonian town of Pucalpa in Peru, where Julianne's father, Hans Wilhelm, worked as a biologist. Her mother, Maria, was an ornithologist who studied birds and their behaviour. Sharing her parents' passion for science and nature, Julianne planned to follow their example by studying biology at university. On board the four-engined Lockheed Electra aeroplane, she could hear other passengers complaining because their flight had been delayed by nearly seven hours. But they were airborne now and Julianne was happy to be on holiday and looking forward to seeing her father. From her window seat, she noticed some storm clouds in the distance, but she loved flying and had no reason to feel afraid. Her mother felt less relaxed about the storm, never quite believing that something metal and heavy could rival the birds she studied Maria didn't like flying at the best of times. Now she began to feel anxious as the Electra dipped suddenly and entered a massive rain-dark cloud. Before long, the plane was being buffeted about by the air currents and after a few minutes, even Julianne began to feel that something wasn't quite right. Bags and other pieces of luggage started to fall from the overhead racks and drinks tipped into the passengers' laps. Soon, Christmas presents and parcels began bouncing around the cabin as the aircraft was pitched up and down by the turbulence. Through her window, Julianne could see flashes of lightning around the aircraft. With the storm obviously closing in, she too began to feel scared. Above the sound of the propellers, several passengers could be heard crying as she reached across for her mother's hand. The violent pitching continued like this for nearly 10 minutes, throwing the aircraft this way and that. Gripping her mother's hand more tightly now, Julianne looked out of the window and saw that one of the engines was glowing brightly. Her mother also noticed this, and very quietly said, that is the end, it's all over. And these were the last words Julianne ever heard her mother say. Moments later, the cabin was plunged into darkness and the Electra went into a steep nosedive. Julianne couldn't see anything in the pitch black and could hear nothing but the roar of the engines. Then, just as suddenly, everything went silent. With a shock, the teenager realised she was somehow outside the aeroplane, still strapped in her seat but tumbling over and over and over. With nothing around her but the rush of cold air, she was plummeting down towards the jungle. Coming out of the clouds, she momentarily glimpsed the tops of the trees spinning up to meet her like a patch of giant broccoli. It was petrifying, but she must have passed out immediately because the next thing she remembered was waking up the following morning. It was Christmas Day. She was still strapped into her seat, but it was now wedged firmly into the ground. 40 minutes after taking off, the aircraft had apparently been struck by lightning. One deadly bolt caused a fuel tank to explode and this ripped off the right wing. As the fuselage began to disintegrate around her, Julianne had been thrown clear of the airborne wreckage and then fell more than two miles down into the jungle. Despite the trauma of this experience, she realised at once what had happened. Looking up at the trees, she knew she'd survived an air disaster, probably because her seat had broken the fall as she crashed through the dense jungle foliage. 
Unsurprisingly, the 17-year-old was in considerable pain and feeling dizzy. She'd broken her collarbone, damaged a ligament in, ligament in one knee and sustained deep cuts and bruises as she hit the ground. Her left eye was also swollen shut, but she could still walk and she knew she had to start finding a way to safety. Julianne had learned enough about the jungle from her parents to know it wasn't as dangerous as people liked to think. Travelling on foot, it was important to keep a cool head and not do anything foolish, but she had no idea where she was or where any of the other passengers had come down. She had also lost a shoe and her glasses, which complicated things as she was very short-sighted, like me. Nor was she dressed for a jungle trek, with only a light cotton summer dress to protect her from the hordes of biting, stinging insects who were buzzing all around her. The first thing to establish was if anyone else was nearby, especially her mother. But when Julianne called out, there was no response except the chatter of startled animals. Sometime later, she was thrilled to hear an aircraft circling overhead. Presumably, the crew were looking for survivors. But since she couldn't see the plane through the thick canopy of trees, she quickly guessed they couldn't see her either. This realisation made her feel utterly alone. For a while, the Copex had lived in a remote scientific research station in the jungle, and Hans Wilhelm had taught his daughter some useful survival tips. For example, he told her that walking through shallow water can be safer than walking on land. Snakes and other venomous creatures are hard to spot on the ground, and they may attack if anyone steps too close to them. Julianne also knew that jungle settlements tend to be built along rivers, so if she stayed near water, she stand a better chance of finding a village and meeting someone and finding help. Until this happened, however, her situation looked desperate. She had nothing to eat except a small bag of sweets, and she had no idea how far she might have to walk to reach safety. Soon, dozens of insects were dropping onto her skin and climbing into her hair, and with the sun up, the rainforest was unbearably hot. It was also very wet because torrential storms like the one that had brought down the electric continued on and off throughout the day. Having failed to find signs of anyone nearby, Julianne started to walk and when she came to a small stream she decided to follow it. It was lucky that there was plenty of water to drink but, by the, but the rainy season meant that there was no ripe fruit on the trees and from her parents' jungle training she knew that eating anything else would be too risky. At nightfall, the temperature dropped dramatically, and with her sleeveless dress wet through, Julianne felt terribly cold. She also felt lonely as well as frightened. Unable to sleep, she sat shivering as she listened to the startling sounds of the rainforest at night. The following morning, she continued slowly along the course of the stream. It didn't take long before the little bag of sweets was empty, and when her watch stopped, she rapidly lost track of time. After a couple of days, she heard the sound of a king vulture somewhere nearby. From her mother, Julia knew these huge carnivorous birds tend to land only where there is lots of food around. Knowing they only eat dead animals, she had to consider the gruesome possibility that the bird was looking for bodies from the plane. To her horror, her fears were proved correct shortly afterwards when she stumbled upon a bank of seats from the aircraft. It was partly buried in the undergrowth, and Julianne could see three bodies still trapped in, strapped in place. For a moment she thought one of them might be her mother, but then she noticed nail varnish on the toes, which Maria never wore. In fact, Julianne never did find any more survivors during her time in the jungle, and she later learned that of the 91 people on board the Electra, she was the only one left alive. For several days she continued her journey downstream, alternately walking and swimming. This made her progress very slow and swimming led to serious burns from the sun beating down on her back and arms. Together with her other injuries, this caused her more and more pain, while a lack of sleep and the effort needed to keep moving only added to her exhaustion. She was also alarmed to find that the insect bites were becoming infected and that live maggots were burrowing under her skin. After a week, Julianne realised that she could not no longer hear any aircraft meaning that the authorities must have stopped looking for survivors. This scared her, but it also made her very angry, knowing they'd given up even though she was in the jungle below still fighting for her life. She began to despair, but on the ninth day, to her astonishment and delight, she found an old broken down boat on a stretch of riverbank where she'd been resting. Her first thought was to take the boat, but she didn't want to be accused of stealing. Instead, she looked around and noticed a path running up the bank and into the trees. Climbing the path took all her strength as she was so tired and so hungry. 
but at the top she found a small shack. Inside it was an outboard motor and a can of fuel which reminded her of a trick her father used to cure the family dog of worms. Pouring petrol onto her wounds ought to kill the maggots or at least get them off her skin. Julia knew the stinging would be excruciating but it had to be worth a try. After dousing one arm in the flammable liquid, she counted no fewer than 40 maggots as they dropped out of her wounds and onto the ground. How horrible. The effort left her even more exhausted, and wrapping herself in the tarpaulin from the shack, she quickly fell asleep. Waking the following day, Julianne didn't feel much better and decided to stay in the shelter a bit longer because she was too tired to move. Outside she could hear another rainstorm beginning, but later, as the rain died away, she thought she could hear voices approaching the shack. Struggling to her feet and pulling open the door, she was overjoyed to see three forestry workers. The men were astonished and she quickly explained about the crash and how she'd spent the last ten days alone in the forest. The men offered her some food, but after so long without anything except water, she was unable to eat it. They quickly decided to take her downriver in their canoe. After seven hours on the water, she was flown to a hospital and then reunited with her father in Pucalpa. Happily, Julianne went on to make a full recovery, although for years afterwards she was haunted by nightmares about her ordeal and the loss of her mother and the other passengers. Julianne never lost her love of biology, however, and after qualifying in Germany, she's returned to Peru many times to visit the rainforest and study its wildlife. Well, I think you can probably see why that story horrified me when I was 10 or 11 years old. And it still does now when I think about it. Although I think especially the maggots in the arms, that's a horrible thing. Um, but as I said at the beginning, it has a happy ending because she was eventually rescued. And also it's interesting to see how, although she was on her own in a terrible, terrible place, she didn't give up. All the stories are a bit like that. Everybody panics to begin with. I think we've all done that. And then eventually they stop and think and work out these tiny little things they can do to help themselves survive. Some of them are pretty horrible, it has to be said. There's a man in, in here who's running a marathon through the Sahara Desert and he drinks his own weed to survive. And another man who spent weeks and weeks on a tiny little raft drifting around in the ocean after a shipwreck. He killed a shark and drank its blood. So anyway, thank you for listening. I say my name's David Long. This is Survivors. It has 30 other stories for you to enjoy. And I hope you enjoyed reading them as much as I enjoyed writing them because it was a lovely book to write. And um, I'll see you soon. Goodbye. Hi, my name's Kerry Hyman and I am the illustrator that did all the pictures for the book Survivors. I've also done um, Heroes and Rescue, which are both written by David Long as well. Um, so I thought I'd tell you a little bit about myself. I always wanted to be um, an illustrator or an artist when I was growing up and so I spent all of my time in school and, and, and outside the school painting and drawing so I just feel really lucky that um, my job today is to, to draw pictures. I do pictures for things like books um, as well as magazines and lots of other stuff as well. So I thought I'd tell you a little bit about how I did the um, some of the artwork for Survivors it's actually all drawn on the computer. So I'll tell you a little bit about how the designer and I worked together to create the cover. To start with, I like to collect together lots of different images. So I'll find other illustrations, photos, and some other book covers, um, just to help me generate ideas so I can come up with um, some sketches and start thinking about what my book cover is going to look like. Then I make a start with um, roughly sketching out something called thumbnails and these are small pretty terrible sketches but they're really useful for me to try and work out the layout and the placement of the elements so I can see if the basic shape of the cover works together. I then move over to my drawing tablet and will start drawing directly into my computer into a program called Adobe Illustrator where I start to um, work out and draw up the first rough sketches of my cover ideas. Drawing in Illustrator is kind of like cutting out lots of small bits of paper and, and shapes and sticking them all together to make a, a larger picture. My first sketches are often in black and white as well so I can use this time to, to play around with the overall look um, of the cover and not get bogged down with, with the colours at this stage. So the most important job that my cover has to do is to 
get across to the viewer that the book contains lots of short stories so I have to come up with a few sketches to try and show this. So I sent these over to the designer and it was decided that the first image was the, the most successful one. He then sent me back a colour mock-up and I got to work choosing three or four different stories that had very contrasting environments. After we decided on the final combination of the scenes, I then set to work polishing off the artwork in Illustrator. This is the jungle scene, so I'll just make sure at this stage everything's neat and tidy and i add lots more layers and details before I take it to the next stage. Next I'll move this all over to Photoshop where I add in lots of textures and hand drawn elements and these can be anything from photos of water or paint splashes or pencil lines and I'll layer these on top with lots of different transparencies to add a bit more depth to the drawing. And then to finish it off I usually do some hand drawn lines so you can see them on like things like the leaves and on the hair of the girl. I worked up all the other images in a similar way and then placed them all together to make the cover image. This was rejigged a bit. Um, as you can see, the Jungle Girl actually ended up on the back. Here's the jungle scene on the back of the book. I hope that was interesting, and I hope that um, these stories are keeping you entertained at the moment while everyone's stuck at home. Perhaps you could have a go at drawing directly onto your computer as well. Like, or if you don't have a computer, you could use an iPad or, or tablet. You don't need a drawing tablet like mine. You can use your finger or a mouse. Or if you don't have any of those things, then just pen and paper will do fine. I hope you have a lovely day. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.